As we uh, continue the Arlington Latin Mass Society Speaker Series, I want to thank everyone for coming. It is my pleasure today to introduce do to you Dr. Joseph Shaw. Dr. Shaw studied politics, theology, and philosophy at Oxford University, gaining a doctorate uh, in 2000. He was a uh, member of the philosophy faculty until 2022. Since 2009, he has been chairman of the UK Latin Mass Society, which has inspired the founding of the Arlington Latin Mass Society. He has also been president of Una Voce International since 2021. His books include Intellectuals in the Latin Mass, Petitions to Save the Ancient Mass from 1966 to 2007, Sacred and Great, A Brief Introduction to the Traditional Latin Mass, and The Liturgy, The Family, and The Crisis of Modernity, to name just three titles. He has been a leading and effective advocate for the traditional Latin Mass across the UK and globally, and there's nobody I can think better equipped to give us an update on the status of the TLM during these difficult times than Dr. Joseph Shaw. Thank you very much. <laughs> To start off with, uh, you may or may not have heard of Una Voce International, the Federatio Internationalis Una Voce in Latin, of which I'm the president. Um, so just very, very briefly, it's a, basically a small group of people who try to keep in touch with Una Voce and Latin mass groups around the world. We don't have authority over any other group, but we try to represent their views and desires in Rome and sometimes to the media. They tell us what is happening in their countries, and we report back on what we hear in Rome. <coughs> if you want to know more, we have a website, fiuv.org. You can sign up to get our magazine, receive little news bulletins from me, and you can even become a friend and give us some money, which is always nice. Um, my work for the FIUV is informed by my long-standing involvement in the Latin Mass Society in England and Wales, of which I am the chairman. So, as well as an international perspective, I have a national perspective and also a local perspective, helping with masses and pilgrimages in the Oxford area. I'm also um, a homeschooling father of nine. My, um, I'm going to argue today that the traditional mass will not be wiped out. Um, not perhaps a very shocking um, conclusion, but um, I'm going to try to explain why I, why I can be quite confident about that. Um, I could make a case for this on supernatural grounds, that it's the traditional Latin Mass, um, the traditional Roman Rite, is too central a, an element of the tradition of the Church to disappear, and so it is unthinkable for the TLM to vanish from the Church um, in a similar way, not the same, but a similar way as it would be unthinkable for the Book of Ruth to disappear from uh, scriptures. Um, however, and I'm not going to go into that any further, um, today I'm going to make a case from natural grounds. I will try to show that the, with the current balance of forces in the church, the disappearance of the traditional mass is very difficult to imagine. This means that while we can't know what a future pope will be like, we do know about the pros and cons of the options which we will be considering, which I think make some options a lot more likely than others. We've just witnessed the rejection of fiducia supplicans by individual bishops and indeed entire bishops' conferences around the world which illustrates the limitations of the power in practice of the Holy See. Sometimes the opposition to an initiative is too big, too entrenched, too difficult to brush aside. In this case, the opposition is able to quote magisterial documents of the recent past to present itself as the sign of moderation and stability. It comes from all over the world. It has representatives amongst the highest prelates and the most prestigious academics. It is simply too strong. To apply this kind of analysis to, in the, to the case of the traditional mass, we must think about its supporters and its opponents and how it has evolved over the decades. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so, the traditional movement. Back in 1970, many well-informed people, no doubt the majority of both prelates and commentators, thought that despite initial resistance to the liturgical reform, the traditional mass would disappear in a generation. The older priests who were given permission to continue to celebrate it would take it to the grave with them. The permission given to the bishops of England and Wales in 1971, which I talk about in my book, 
um, about the petitions, to allow the occasional public celebration of the traditional Roman rite was similarly expected by many to be temporary, although, thanks, it did not say so in the wording of the document. Um, in 1984, this permission was extended to the whole world, but as I note uh, in the same book, even after 1988, successive prefects of the Pontifical Commission, Ecclesia Dei, thought that the traditional mass was something to be wound down, causing conflicts in 1993, 1999, and again in 2000. On the other hand, the various indults can be understood from the point of view of the Holy See as ways of relieving pressure. There was a lot of people asking for this. Their request didn't seem wholly unreasonable, though it did present some problems. So some accommodation with it was appropriate, though with strict limitations. What the Holy See wanted to avoid back in those days was wholesale fiducia supplicans style rejection of the liturgical reform, both because the curial officials were professionally committed to the reform and because they thought any relaxation of pressure to conform to the reformed books would cause chaos. They were having huge problems with liturgical abuses at the time and didn't want to admit there was a problem with a new missal without abuses. Traditionists were consistently told that they should devote themselves to making the Novus Ordo work, which they proved very reluctant to do, which I'll come back to that. Failing that, the best option seemed to be tightly regulated and what they thought would be temporary permissions for the old mass, for the sake of a quiet life. Never underestimate the allure of the quiet life uh, for an, a, uh, <laughs> a bureaucrat. <coughs> On the other hand, from the time the SSPX was officially suspended in 1976, Efforts began to be made to reconcile them, and it was clear that the liberty of the traditional mass was a precondition for this. Talks with the SSPX failed in 1988, but by then the idea that the church could cope with groups of traditional priests and communities was established, and the fraternity of St. Peter, various Benedictine communities, and many others were accommodated on that basis. This is significant because it would be absurd for the Holy See to approve the statutes of new institutions and then immediately work to, under, to undermine them and try to close them down. When the SSPX, sorry, what the SSPX had demonstrated was that there were hundreds of priests and many thousands of faithful who were devoted to this form of the liturgy. It should be emphasized that this is not an unfamiliar situation in the history of the church, and it is clear that sensible popes give way on liturgical questions that do not impinge on the faith, where the unity of the church and the salvation of souls is at stake. Do former Hussites want to receive the precious blood? Do Croatians want the mass in Glagolitic? Do Ukrainians want the Eastern liturgy? Do former Lutherans want to sing vernacular hymns? In each case, they were allowed to have these things, even if there was a bit of conflict, inconsistency, and confusion. What sort of a pope wants to be responsible for the loss of souls for the sake of these kinds of issues? <coughs> Sometimes the permissions can be wound down after a generation or two, as the reception of the chalice was for the former Hussites, and the hymns singing for the former Lutherans was supposed to be. But in other cases, they become permanent local practices. The ancient Roman jurists said that the good of the people is the supreme law, and the canonists of the church adopted this as a principle of the law of the church, salus animarum lex suprema est, words you can read today in canon 1752, the very last canon of the 1983 code. In short, what traditionists had and have to demonstrate was that our attitude sorry, that our attachment to the ancient mass is so strong that banning it altogether would create a major pastoral problem. This leads to awkward conversations, but our predecessors in the movement were willing to force the issue, and we are willing to do it again. I can say this in the context of the Una Voce movement, and it is equally clear that the fraternity of St. Peter and the other institutes and communities, and of course the SSPX, are no less determined to... Uh, hold on to our liturgical patch patrimony. <coughs> Many priests 
celebrate and many lay Catholics attend both the old and new regularly and quite happily and if that works that is fine but they should appreciate that they are able to do so only because a hard core of trads over many years have had a higher level of commitment to the old mass as G.K. Chesterton said somewhere we can be broad-minded because our ancestors were narrow-minded um, I I want to say a bit more about this because, I mean, it sounds a bit, um, well, harsh perhaps. Um, you know, here we are, annoying trads, kind of reveling in how annoying we are. And I want to try and explain why. <laughs> um, I don't think it's a great mystery, but it's, it's, it's a, a question of how exactly we should articulate the fact that we don't really want to go to the Nevis Ordo. Um, I think a lot of people find this difficult to understand. Um, it isn't too difficult to, to argue that the traditional mass has value. And indeed, I can quote the words of Annibale Bugnini and Pope Paul VI to show that it has value. But what justification could there be for insisting on it? I think I am a fairly typical um, member of the Una Voce movement in my own attitude and practice. I am, in fact, a cradle Catholic, and I went to the Reform Mass until I discovered the traditional one, in my case, at the age of 30. And I will certainly attend the Novus Ordo to fulfill my obligations and for some special occasion, if um, there's no traditional option. Um, I was baptized and confirmed with the new rites and went to confession using them for many years. And in my view, it would be ludicrous as well as sacrilegious to attempt to repeat my baptism or my confirmation and a matter of harmful scrupulosity to repeat my youthful confessions. On the other hand, I almost never in practice attend the Nevis Order, um, because I make it a priority to seek out the old mass. I'm currently very lucky where I live, although, of course, it's far from being a matter of luck. But there have been times in my life when my liturgical commitments meant long drives or early starts yanking small children out of bed in the dark, or spending much of the Lord's day in the car. What can explain this if I don't think the Novus Ordo is invalid? So that's the challenge. It's an important question because, to repeat, it is only because the traditional movement is in large part made up of annoying and puzzling people like me that it has had any impact on the church. If we all just preferred the old mass in the way that some people prefer the Novus Order, the way it is done at their local Benedictine monastery or Eucharistic Prayer 1 or the sermons of Father X or whatever, then it would have disappeared with the last of the priests who had permission to celebrate it on grounds of age. The struggle and the suffering, the fights and the negotiations, the time and the treasure, and the energy which has been devoted to preserving the traditional mass would not have been forthcoming. Different aspects of what motivates us are harder for different people outside the movement to understand. I think priests, for example, can often fail to appreciate the effect of liturgical abuses on the faithful, since outside religious communities, they are only rarely obliged to attend mass not celebrated by themselves. Similarly, those without children sometimes don't appreciate the importance for children of having a consistent liturgical formation. I think some intellectual Catholics and some of those who love being involved in the liturgy as extraordinary ministers and readers and things like that don't really get the liturgical experience of people who simply experience the liturgy and not primarily think about it or in some sense do it. I think that all these categories of Catholics, priests, the childless, the intellectuals, and the extraordinary minister and lector brigade inadvertently contribute to a lot of misunderstandings in the debate. However, while these factors are real, I don't think that any of these things are actually the fundamental issue. This was, in fact, expressed quite clearly by Pope Benedict XVI in his 2007 letter to bishops. First, he wrote, 
Young persons, too, have discovered this liturgical form, felt its attraction, and found in it a form of encounter with a mystery of the Most Holy Eucharist, particularly suited to them, unquote. Young persons, too, not only young persons. I fancy that we are all here today because we have found in the ancient Mass a form of encounter with the Holy Eucharist particularly suited to us. No one forces us to go, not if we are adults anyway, with, without condemning any other pathway to God offered by the complex reality of the church. We have found this liturgical tradition spiritually helpful. Indeed, I often read of people whose lives are changed by discovering the traditional mass, and I would say that's true of me as well. Second, Pope Benedict wrote later in the same document, what earlier generations held as sacred remains sacred and great for us too, and it cannot be all of a sudden entirely forbidden or even considered harmful. It behooves all of us to preserve the riches which have developed in the church's faith and prayer and to give them their proper place. Unquote. Those of us who have felt the attraction of the traditional mass and who have been changed by it feel an obligation towards it. We want to preserve it, to pass it on to our children, to make it available for those who are today searching for something, something they do not even know exists, perhaps as we once searched ourselves. Something I think needs to be emphasized to those struggling to understand our movement from the outside is that the energy we have to work for the ancient liturgy cannot simply be redirected to the Novus Ordo in Latin or Gregorian chant in English or any other such quixotic project because this energy is born of the traditional mass. We have this energy, this determination, because of our experience of the traditional mass, because of the way it has changed our lives, and because of our recognition of its value. I have been writing a lot recently about the way traditions create obligations. This is something that atomistic individualism rejects, and I'm conscious that I'm standing right next to the global headquarters of atomistic individualism as I speak. Needless to say, sorry, nevertheless, it is easy to think of examples of people feeling the tug of their traditions, which some will dismiss as irrational, but which is human all the same. People can feel regret, for example, at failing to pass on to their children their cultural artifacts they themselves received, such as tradition of cookery, of minority languages, religious festivals, clothing, and so on. The greater the value of what you have been given, the greater the importance of passing it on. What sort of a person deprives the next generation of his community of the valuable things, the intriguing and fertile cultural possessions, the things that speak of one's roots and what it means to have a home that were passed on to him? Well, the radical individualist does so, or the person who thinks these riches are bad, or that they are incompatible with modern life, or that they are associated with low social status. Those of my age and younger are the heirs of a generation infected with a bad dose of individualism. Mothers who, in some cases, consciously and self-righteously refused to teach their daughters to cook or sew. Priests and bishops who did not pass on the good things that they had received. For myself, I am determined to recover and pass on whatever shattered remnants there are of value in the traditions of the church that I can. I feel the obligation, and I think this is a common feeling. It doesn't mean that we all have to write books or give talks. It is primarily a matter of how we understand the duties of our state of life. But we traditional Catholics are stubborn about it, and we are right to be stubborn. If someone is happy with the Novus Ordo, that is fine, but don't try to stop us preserving the mass of the saints and martyrs, the scholars and the popes, the peasants and soldiers and kings of so many centuries, which has given us so much and has so much to offer future generations if it survives to reach them. <laughs> 
I don't think this is fanaticism. I would call it taking seriously the fourth commandment, honor thy father and mother. Like our predecessors in the movement, we will continue to make it clear that neither the faithful nor the clergy attached to traditional mass is going to give it up, either via the intermediate books of 1965 and 1968 or the Novus Ordo in Latin or anything else. Outsiders can think we are rational if they must, but they do at least recognize that our attachment to traditional mass is extremely powerful. The point is, whether you like it or not, banning the traditional mass would cause pastoral problems, which are totally disproportionate to whatever good any reasonable person could hope to gain. We are going to protest, to write, to speak, to make a fuss, to lie down in front of the bulldozers, to organize, to gain the sympathy of non Catholic media figures, to recruit artists and celebrities to the cause to go underground and to keep popping up again, and in general, to be a huge pain in the neck. And we will do so in the knowledge that this was done in past centuries by those who insisted often very much against the will of the people in authority to preserve the Ambrosian rite in Milan, the Byzantine rite among Catholics in Ukraine and Russia, as I've already mentioned, the distinctive charisms of venerable religious orders, and going back even further, the veneration of images in the East. It is not too much of a stretch to compare our attitude to the stubbornness of those who preserve the Catholic belief, the Catholic faith itself, as well as its cultural manifestations. In the various persecutions of Britain, Ireland, Mexico, France, Spain, Germany, China, and elsewhere, we are grateful to them for their stubbornness, and the future generations will be grateful to us, because we are giving future generations the chance to experience something which they will not otherwise have. They will be able to be broad-minded because we have been narrow-minded. So I'm going to move on now to the opponents of the traditional movement. And to get a handle on them, it is natural to start with the language of Pope Francis's 2021 Apostolic Letter, Traditionis Cassides, and the Letter to Bishops that accompanied it. These seem to be written in a conscious parallel to Pope Benedict's 2007 Apostolic Letter to Simon Pontificum and its accompanying letter to bishops. Both the Apostolic Letters start with historic preamble. Some of the same terms are used, such as stable groups. Both of the letters to bishops appeal to the words of St. Paul to justify themselves as many people have pointed out, Pope Francis' documents present two quite different explanations of the need to restrict the traditional mass. One is in terms of the people who attend it, characterizing them, as far as I can see, as sedivacantists or something along those lines. The letter to bishops makes reference to this in three paragraphs. This denigration of Catholics attached to traditional mass is strange, not only because it is false, but because traditionis custodis does not coincide with any reversal of Pope Francis' friendly policy towards the SSPX. I don't want to say that the SSPX officially holds the positions parodied in the 2021 letter to bishops, but if you want to find people who say that, and I quote, Vatican Council II betrayed the tradition and the true church, unquote, or indeed who expose the church to the, quote, perils of tradition, unquote, then the SSPX would seem a more plausible pace to go fishing than the typical celebration held under the auspices of Summorum Pontificum. However, it moves on from this putative justification for the restrictions to something quite distinct, the supposed problem of liturgical diversity. I quote the letter to bishops. Saint Paul VI declared that the revision of the Roman Missal carried out in the light of ancient liturgical sources had the goal of permitting the church to raise up in, a, in the variety of languages a single and identical prayer that expressed her unity this unity I intend to re-establish throughout the church in, of the Roman rite. End of quotation. Oddly, Pope Paul used that quoted phrase 
a single and identical prayer. In making the point that liturgical diversity does not stop the Mass being a single and identical prayer. An argument he needs to make because he was introducing an unprecedented diversity of languages and options into the Roman Rite. This seems to be the opposite of the point Pope Francis is trying to make. However, the text of Traditionis Custodes itself doubles down on this idea. Whereas Samorum Pontificum asserts in its Article 1 that there are two forms of the Roman Rite, this is reversed in Article 1 of Traditionis Custodes, which says in the official English translation that the Novus Ordo is the unique expression of the Roman Rite. This is not easy to understand, but in the Italian version, the phrase is unica expressione, the only expression, and the Latin follows this, also unica. Whereas Simon Pontificum told us that the Roman Rite had two forms or expressions, we are now told that there is only one. Such an explicit contradiction between two papal documents only 14 years apart is something one does not expect. And also something I would have thought not strictly necessary to do traditionis custodis as a legal document. Pope Francis could surely have imposed restrictions on the extraordinary form of the Roman Rite if he had wanted to do so. But he went further. Indeed, this itself creates problems. How can you have a historic liturgy which, despite everything, continues to be authorized for use of the church, which is not an expression of the church's lex orandi? Leaving aside our assessment of these claims, we do at least have two ideas from these documents. First, that the trans are bad people, and second, that liturgical diversity is a bad thing. After Traditionis Custodes came out, I went to Rome several times and spoke to a good number of people off the record, curial officials, journalists, diplomats, priests, and so on. And I also read a lot of articles and interviews with people whom one would assume would have some authoritative information about it. I learned a lot, but not what I set out to discover. What I thought I might find was some kind of party line which people might agree with or not, but would at least be there, and which would build on the rather obscure explanations given in the documents. Thus, on the idea of trads as bad people, I asked everyone I could to pin this down a bit more for me. Is the problem laity or priests, diocesan clergy or priests from the traditional institutes, Americans with YouTube channels or ordinary mass goers, and so on? To this kind of probing question, there was no consistent answer. There was no party line, no inside story that one would think would emanate from Pope Francis' inner circles and make its way to senior members of the Curia to favor journalists and outwards from there. Instead, there are a lot of clever people who have been forced to speculate about what it is all about. The answers I received can be summarized as follows. The papal confidant, Father Antonio Spadaro, in an article, blamed the traditional mass becoming associated with one side in American politics. In a leaked letter to the Congregation of the Doctor of the Faith, the French bishops didn't like some of the laity attached to the traditional mass. The American and or French complaints might well be what Pope Francis meant when he complained about ideologization if that's a word. Some in the Curia blamed us and priests who started celebrating traditional mass in an undiplomatic way. The liturgists, Andrea Grillo, seems to have been the source for the idea that in Traditions Custodes that the Novus Order is the only expression of the Lex Orandi of the Roman Rite. The journalist Diana Montagna reported that a meeting of cardinals which proposed restrictions on the traditional mass before the documents was drafted, focused on the growth of the Chartres pilgrimage in France and the idea that participants were suffering from, and I quote, psychological and sociological problems, unquote. She also reported that the survey of bishops about the traditional mass organized by the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith received 
clearly coordinated negative responses from scores of Italian bishops. I also heard a whole series of stories about Pope Francis telling traditionally inclined priests that he supported their work and that they can continue to celebrate the traditional mass, even in St. Peter's itself, and so on. And even blaming the Congregation of Divine Worship for their persecution of the traditional mass. Then again, it has been repeatedly impressed on me, privately as well as publicly, by people in the congregation, or dicastery it is now, is called, that they are not persecuting us at all. Very reassuring. Multiple explanations could be true simultaneously, but that isn't what my interlocutors thought. So, for example, several of the explanations I've just mentioned focus on lay people, but I was told emphatically by the most important people I spoke to that lay people, whatever their shortcomings, had nothing to do with it. If there is no single official or semi-official explanation for restricting the traditional mass, I infer that Traditionis Custodes came into being thanks to a coalition of people who wanted it for different reasons. American bishops, irritated by priests sticking extra-traditional masses into the parish timetable without asking them first. French bishops, embarrassed by traditionalist monarchists. Italian bishops, annoyed that all those vocations are going to the traditional seminaries. They grab hold of some lazy stereotypes about traditionalists being rigid, which have been given an airing by Pope Francis over the years. Those looking for a theological justification of, for restricting the traditional mass find the ideas of Andrea Grillo useful, but they don't take them to their logical conclusion, which would mean abolishing the right of Zaire and maybe the Eastern churches for good measure. It is worth remembering that Pope Francis continued to make friendly, practical gestures towards the traditional movement right up to 2020, allowing masses in honor of recently canonized saints in March of that year. The previous December, he had allowed the Institute of Christ the King to use a basilica in Rome, a stone's throw from the Vatican. Nor does Traditionis Cassides fit in at all with Pope Francis' ongoing attempts to art rapprochement with the SSPX and his decree in favor of the fraternity of St. Peter. Traditionis Cassides clearly wasn't long planned and it doesn't cohere with his other policies, but this is rather Pope Francis' style. He's not a deep plotter. He just allows himself to be persuaded to do one thing after Another, and I don't mean that in the sense that he's being pushed around, it's just that he just thinks it's a good idea. In relation to the traditional mass, as also in relation to same-sex relations, I would suggest that things have come to a crisis in what are presumably the final years of this pontificate, but precisely because they appear to be the final years. Ideological opponents of the traditional mass and those in favor of same-sex relationships see this as their last chance to make a big move under a liberal pope of his generation. Opportunistic cardinals see these as issues they can use to catch votes in the next conclave. So, what happens next? In the 1960s, the liturgical reform was based on a coherent set of ideas backed up by a group of prestigious scholars. There were problems with many of the ideas, don't get me started, and tensions between some of the scholars, but nevertheless, there were themes and arguments that had a certain plausibility and could be popularized, and these appeared regularly in the Catholic press and in mass market books to explain what was happening and respond to objections. There is nothing equivalent to that in support of Traditionis Custodes. In the same way, there wasn't anything like this in support of Amoris Laetitia, which ended up being defended by complete nobodies, like the piano teacher Stephen Wolford. Do you remember him? Probably not. Again, there has been very little of substance to back up fiducia supplicans, which I think that even its supporters would now rather forget. This is the consistent note of the present pontificate. These documents are the products of an intellectually exhausted liberal Catholicism, trying to make the most of its temporary control of the levers of power. 
An easy way to see this in the case of traditionalis custodes is that would-be popularizers of papal policy like Austin Ivory and Mike Lewis don't consistently use Andrea Gurio's arguments, which, as I noted, they appear to be referenced in Traditionis Custodes itself. The reason, I imagine, is that they are too complicated and controversial, and if you try to draw out the implications, many of the prelates, Ivory and Lewis, want to support, wouldn't agree with them. The American Dominican and curial Archbishop Augustine de Noia, who gave an interview in support of Traditionis Custodes when it came out, came up with a completely different theological explanation in terms of the traditional mass encouraging private devotion, which also doesn't seem to have been taken up by the popularizers. Instead, the where Peter is crowd tell us that the traditional mass is itself is not the problem, but the people who attend it. The reason for this is that it minimizes at least this is my interpretation, it minimizes the painful discontinuity between Pope Francis and his predecessor. So it's more a disagreement of uh, practical implications of the policy rather than disagreement of principle. In any case, rather than backing this assertion about nasty traditionalists up, even with the most cherry-picked examples, they seem to have given up on this line of argument rather quickly and revert to mere appeals to papal authority. The argument is very simple. The Pope has decreed it, so it must be right, unless it was the wrong Pope or they happen to disagree with it. Glad we've got that clear. So <laughs> what this all means is that although a lot of powerful people must have come together to make tradition its custodes happen, the roots of the movement behind it are extremely shallow. If the powerful people find that persecuting the traditional mass no longer gets them what they want, preferment, influence, the discomfiture of their opponents, they will walk away from it as if they never had anything to do with it, and it will collapse like a souffle. Indeed, apart from Archbishop de Noia and Cardinal Roach in the Curia and Cardinals Gregory and Supich in the USA, it is pretty difficult to think of any senior churchmen who have openly supported the persecution of the traditional mass. And even these men have only said so in the odd interview. Where are the scholarly articles? Where are the books? The next question is, under what circumstances would today's supporters of traditionalist Castellis decide to abandon it? One would simply be a new pontificate. The cardinals who thought that opposition to the traditional mass would distinguish them from certain other cardinals in the conclave and gave them influence over a certain block of votes will cease to have any reason to oppose the traditional mass. They will start thinking about it in a more pragmatic way as they had been up to 2020. What, though, is the next pope going to think about it? The working assumption of both conservatives and the more sensible liberals of Pope John Paul II's generation, reflected very much in official documents, is that the reformed liturgy will be fine if it is done well. We were fortunate to have in Pope Benedict XVI a pope who with the heart and the mind to see beyond this, to the value of what had been officially abandoned. Both the John Paul II and the Benedict XVI attitudes were naturally manifested in a policy towards traditional mass that is worldwide. Another quite different policy has been manifested in the traditional studies for rather different reasons. So another worldwide policy. My thought at this point is that we are not going to get another one-size-fits-all policy. Just as Pope Benedict abandoned John Paul II's forlorn and half-hearted attempts to stamp out liturgical abuses, so a new pope who has lived through these destructive conflicts will abandon the forlorn and half-hearted attempts to stamp out the traditional mass. Let's consider four broad categories of possible new pope. Hell, incidentally, will freeze over before an American is elected. At one end of the spectrum, there might be candidates out there with a strong ideological aversion to the traditional mass who would like to continue the current policy. 
This is the most worrying possibility, of course, but such a person becoming Pope would have to recognize the policy's high cost in terms of his relationship with bishops around the world. It seems very likely that a new Pope hostile to the traditional mass would give bishops more freedom to deal with it even while speaking out against it. At the other end of the spectrum, there might be candidates who would like to encourage the traditional mass or who simply see it uh, in a vaguely positive light. There are many bishops and cardinals in the second category, as we have seen with the reluctance of bishops, even in places like Germany and France, to clamp down on it following traditionalist custodes. A new pope with views along these lines would, if at all sensible, still want to be cautious, at least for a good few years, and the easiest way to get the TLM to grow would be to allow bishops who like it to allow it, without forcing bishops to allow it who don't like it. So in practice, their policy would look a lot like the policy of a pope who takes a diametrically opposite view, even if their rhetoric would be different. In between these are candidates with little or no experience of the traditional mass. And I don't have any uh, um, list of, of possible papabile, but among the pope, the, the, the people who have been touted um, recently by journalists, think of Cardinal uh, Doe from Hungary, or Cardinal Pizzaballa, the Latin patriarch of Jerusalem, or a cardinal from Africa. None of these cardinals would really have these strong views. Um, given the toxic nature of the debate, giving the power back to bishops seems the obvious thing for them as well. There can be no certainty about this. The next pope might really hate the traditional mass and be determined to destroy it regardless of the cost. All I can say is that this is very unlikely because that kind of hatred very, is very seldom found outside the generation personally, emotionally invested in the liturgical reform, and no electable cardinal is old enough. We can also be sure that a new pope will have real, enough real problems to deal with that he won't need to create problems, as was done with traditionalist Castellos. So my view is that a new pope is likely to return the legal situation to something close to the rules of Ecclesia Dei, Bishops genuinely have the authority to allow or not allow celebrations of the traditional mass. You may be thinking that the situation under Ecclesia Day was pretty horrible, and in many ways it was. But going back to this framework in the circumstances of 2025 or whenever it might be, is going to be very different from living under it between 1988 and 2007. The number of laity asking for the traditional mass, the number of priests able to say it, the church buildings becoming redundant, the shortage of priests, and the change of generations will make a renewed Ecclesia Dei regime very different from the old one. If the traditional mass once again has legal recognition as something positive in the life of the church, it will grow. <laughs> um, um, well, this, this, my trip, my current trip is organized by the uh, people behind the um, Mass of the Ages film. And they're having, as you probably know, two screenings in the area. And I'm going to go to both of those and I'm going to um, answer questions at, uh, at the end of them. So do come along. Um, there's a discount code floating around the internet, which I can even give you um, if you need it, to, if you want to book a ticket. And I'll have copies of my books there. 
um, and um, I'm sure it'll be uh, an amusing evening. But that's really why I'm here. And um, they very kindly paid for my flights, and I'm just filling in the time between <laughs> beginning and end of this. So I, I, I haven't. This isn't a deeply plotted trip, and I, I'm not seeing uh, any bishops or, 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 or anything. Um, but I'm delighted to be seeing um, you. <laughs> Um, uh, well, I, I, it depends what you mean by, by, by prominent. I am meeting people, but basically only people who are based here uh, from, 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 this, from this area. So, I, I'm, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, um, you mentioned saying Tarsina. Yes. Well, um, it depends who you ask. I mean, <laughs> but well, let me tell you about Silver Cantists. Uh, if you, I mean, if you these don't know. Latin mass, um, are well, actually, um, as a, to be a Silver Cantist, you don't necessarily need to say the traditional mass. I mean, you, you, you could be, you can have views on all sorts of all sorts of views about other issues. But what's what a Silver Cantist is is someone who thinks that the throne of Saint Peter is empty. Um, and in fact, we're all sedivacantists when the Pope dies and before the next Pope is, uh, is elected. <laughs> but they think that something has gone wrong with the process of electing um, Popes and that none of the recent ones have been, or at least not the current one, is, 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 is valid. So um, in practice, sedivacantism is characterized at the moment uh, by um, people who like the traditional mass, um, sometimes have, were formally associated with the SSBX. And, um, but who got so frustrated with uh, what they regard as the problems of the church that they've come to the conclusion that the only explanation for these problems is the fact that the Pope is not really the Pope. Um, which is an observation, which, a, a, a conclusion which is unfortunate because many times in the history of the church we've had all kinds of problems, including problems with the Pope, and that hasn't meant the Pope wasn't the Pope. It just means that we've got problems with the Pope. <laughs> we've had, you know, Popes preaching heresy. We've had Popes being, you know, corrupt. We've had Popes committing terrible crimes. We've had Popes who are kind of just totally useless. And none of those things, unfortunately, you know, stop you being Pope. Um, at least not in a way that would be useful. <laughs> so... We just um, have to endure. <laughs> Does that answer your question? So who else? It was someone else. Um, I'm interested in your view that it's actually that you take away from the Novus Ordo and it sounds when you do it in Latin. That it's not oh, yes. It's supposed to be mm -hmm. done in, uh, in Latin and that it's easier uh, just to do a TLM rather than do the Novus Order in Latin. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, yeah. Yes, so um, one of the arguments I, I, I develop in, in, um, um, over the years is, is well, I think it's in, it's in, it's in the, the book, the family book that I've got there, is that um, I want to be, try to be fair with the Novus Order. Um, and the people who created it. Um, they, they had certain ideas, which I, I don't uh, agree with wholly, but they kind of make sense on their own terms. So the idea is, um, as I would see it, is, is, is um, uh, there's too much emphasis in the Nervous Ordo on the uh, understanding it word by word by word. Um, however, I can, I can appreciate that there is an advantage to understanding something word by word by word. You understand the text. That's great. The texts are lovely. Um, well, they can be. Um, in the liturgical texts, they can have all sorts of interesting things to say. And it's also prayers, which offer up to God. So, yeah, I can see there is an advantage to understanding it word by word by word. Um, and they've really done gone for it in the Nova Sword in creating it to make this happen. They've made the text shorter. They've made the text less theologically complex. They've made the text audible, 
I mean, you'd never understand it if it was silent, but, I mean, great tracks of the traditional mass are silent, of course, so... Um, actually, there are exceptions. Never saw those, still a couple of silent prayers, but leaving them aside, they're nearly all now allowed, and they've made it in the vernacular. Um, now, you think about all those changes. Um, they're shorter, they're simpler, they're allowed, they're in the vernacular. Now, it, it, of course, it's perf perfectly possible to, to have the nervous order in, in Latin, and we're constantly being told this. So you take away the vernacular. So we have texts which are shorter, which are simpler, but they're in Latin. So what was the point of making them shorter and simpler and allowed if they're then going to be delivered in a language that practically no one can understand word by word. Oh, yeah, you could sit there with a, with a, with a missalette and, and, and look at them, but then you could do that with the, you know, but that is not what they're envisaging. Uh, so it, it just seems to me um, missing the point of the Novus Ordo to have it in Latin. Now, um, I went to the Novus Ordo in Latin for, for years uh, in the oratories in, in England. And uh, no, I did quite like it. Um, well, yeah, I did like it. Uh, <laughs> I won't, won't lie. But it's a bit of a, it's a, bit of a, a niche thing. Um, I think that a lot of people uh, you know, experience it you know, a few times and they just think, oh, this is just not for me. It's, it's kind of it's sort of some sort of weird intellectual kind of thing that, that, that highly educated people uh, do um, because they've got some sort of thing about Latin. Um, that's, not what the, well, that's not what the traditional mass is like at all. You know, you go into a traditional congregation and it's, it's very uh, diverse in terms of education and background and, and stuff. And, of course, you have the children. Um, now, no one... No one would suggest the Novus Ordo in Latin was kind of particularly suited to children. Why would anyone think that having this simple liturgy uh, and then translating it into Latin, well, sorry, not translating it into Latin, but failing to translate it into the vernacular, would be particularly suitable for children? But as we all know, if we have any experience of children at liturgy, it does, the traditional mass does work for children. Um, because it works on a completely different basis. So, you don't have to understand it word by word to by word to get something out of it. You're getting things out of the atmosphere, the ritual, the incense, the complexity, the sacred music. You can have some of those things in the Novus Order. Yes, but again, you're, if you do put all those things in the Novus Order, you're, again, you're pulling it away from what it was designed to do. I'm not saying it's liturgical abuse. It's just... it's. Those guys in the 70s who were telling us that it's just contrary to the spirit of the Novus Ordo to try to kind of have this reform the reform thing and try to do everything with the most traditional possible option and to have the bells and the smells and the Latin and the... Um, or ad orientum. You know what? They had a point. There is a, a sense in which the Novus Ordo works in its own terms with this comprehensibility. And there are other, I mean, I could, I could illustrate the, the, the point equally with other aspects of it, um, such as, you know, what you can see. You can say, say all the same things about the, the, the ceremonies. You've got to be able to see them. The priest has to face the people. They've got to be simple enough to understand, so they're all simplified. There's fewer of them, etc., etc. The people have more participation in them. So, in the same way, it's not mysterious, it's not intriguing, it's not kind of weird, it doesn't draw you in that way. That's one way of drawing people into things. Um, no, it draws you into it in a different way, in a way which is more, I don't know, intellectual, more rational. Um, but yeah, it, it has a certain point. Um, it's, 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 it's not within the kind of liturgical tradition. This, this approach, it's a new approach. Um, that doesn't mean it's bad, it, it's just it's a new approach and it's, 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 I think that there's, there's problems with it. Um, but ultimately the, the proof of the pudding is, is whether it works. Pastorally, 
Um, but as for having a bit of this and a bit of that, you're going to fall between two stools. So that's, 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 my, that's, my, that's my thought. Yes? I'm probably older than anybody in the room. A lot older. And I remember when the, transi when the transition was taking place. I was out of the country, but I was in a, in a place where there were a lot of Catholic priests and a lot of, and, they, and those Catholic priests were Americans. It was a missionary situation. And when the transition began to take place in the 60s, there was something called, at, the, at that time, I don't know whether any of you are familiar with the, what was called the dialogue mass, mm -hmm. where the, where the, uh, there was audience participation at the Kyrie, at the Gloria, at the Credo, at the Agnes Dei, and so forth and so on. Now, I don't see that anymore. Uh, it might be, and, and when I go to a Latin Mass, I've been to Latin Masses, TLMs, I mean, uh, at several locations in the U.S., uh, I, don't, I don't see it. In Dallas, for example, at the FSSP, or, or Arlington, Texas, what it was, suburban Dallas. Urban. What is it? Urban. Urban, thank you. There was no participation, as I recall. St. Rita's here locally, we don't know what to do, whether we respond out loud to the Dominus Vobiscum or for certain points. Uh, so what about the dialogue? Is the dialogue part of your uh, arsenal of possibilities? Well, um, it does happen in some places. Um, so we're talking about low mass, the mass without, without music. So, so when we're talking about the dialogue mass, we have in mind a mass without music, so yes, uh, low yes, mass. Yes, so, yeah, so um, in, a, in, a, in a, a sung mass, people do respond with some of the responses, um, that which are sung. So, um, et cum spiritu tuo and stuff. Um, so, the idea that the low mass, um, low mass there should be responses from the people, was introduced... Um, in the course of the 20th century, so the first, the first uh, experiments with it were, were just before the First World War in Belgium. Um, and then in, um, in, in the, at first, the authorities of Rome weren't very keen on it, and then they kind of came around to it a bit. And then in the 40s and 50s, they were sort of recommending it, but not insisting on it. Um, but then, of course, it got swallowed up by the big changes. So. If you went to mass in 1960, you know, um, before, before the changes happened, you, you, you might find uh, people responding, um, and you might not. Uh, so it caught on in, in France, for example, uh, much more than in the United States or England. Um, and it's, you, you still find it in France. So if you go to low mass in France, whether uh, celebrated by you know, Fraternity of Sabita or the SSPX or, or anyone, you'll very often find um, the people responding, for example, to the um, uh, preparatory prayers at the beginning, um, um, to the other things the service says. Um, but and one, of the, one of the things about it was that it was always a bit, uh, a bit unclear exactly what you were supposed to be doing. If you look, I mean, the document that really sets it out is something called um, uh, De Musica Sacra uh, in 1958. And they give four different levels of dialogue. Um, so, you know, do you say the creed? Do you say the gloria? Do you say the paternoster? So there's all sorts of different kind of... And it's, that's one of the reasons why it was, it was kind of... It was a bit kind of... The whole thing was a bit odd uh, and didn't catch up in, in, in every place. And it's quite difficult to... to reintroduce it if you think it's a good idea because of this kind of confusion and people go from one place to another and they kind of you know find those different practices going on i think it was supposed to be a kind of transitional thing it was also an attempt to try to make low mass in a parish which was perhaps the main mass of a of a sunday try to make it more of a production as you say over here <laughs> so um, 
dialoguing and also um, sometimes uh, singing vernacular hymns um, to kind of make it more of a kind of, you know, big thing. Um, it, well, what, what they should have been doing, uh, at least according to Pope Pius XII, who, who wrote about this, is they should have been having sung masses, you know, uh, with, with you know, Gregorian chant and stuff. So, um, nevertheless, someone says it was difficult. But so, so now, you know, we come back to it and people tend to pick up in, in, a, in a country uh, what they were doing before the council and perhaps what some, you know, stray priests have been doing privately or if they're retired or whatever um, in the intermediate time. So the French have gone back to the dialogue mass, even though it hadn't been going for all that long in France before the council. Nevertheless, that's what they've gone back to. And in England and America, we tend not to. So it's not, I mean, it's, it's you're allowed to do it. Um, I personally, I, I've, my, my experience has been without the dialogue, and I, I like the non-dialogued mass because it's so, uh, well, people call it the silent mass, um, which is not quite true, but it's, 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 it's something, something very contemplative and, and peaceful about it. And I think that's the great strength of traditional mass, that it in, encourages you to engage with the liturgy in a contemplative way. And the dialoguing can slightly get in the way of that, either if it's not even if you don't do it, but other people are doing it, then it's kind of, it's, 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 it's a different kind of liturgical experience. It's much, a bit more like the nervous order. I don't, I don't want to condemn it completely. If people want to do it, then um, as long as they don't disturb other people who don't want to do it. <laughs> mm. um, uh, yeah, do you want to? Yeah, I was going to ask, do you mm -hmm. think Rome's continued approval of some societies like the SSP to um, yeah. use pre-55 holy week? Do you think that's a good sign? Um, well, they, they, they allowed them for three years. Now, I can't remember when that began and ended now, but it was, it was anyway, three years. But they came to an end, and they didn't extend it. So that's the official position. What was the question? Please? The question was, um, the, um, the Holy See, um, before, uh, um, so, I don't know, five or six years ago, no uh, longer ago than it must be, they gave permission for a period of three years for um, some people who applied for this permission to celebrate their Holy Week ceremonies, the Triduum, in accordance with the pre-1955 liturgical books. So in 1955, um, 1956, there was, there was, they were changed. Um, so, yeah, they gave that permission for three years, and then uh, it lapsed. Um, and as a matter of practice, it, 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 it has continued in, in some places. But um, we can start talking about complicated things like local customs and um, customs contrary to laws, which actually, you know, become legally possible and, and, and complicated things like that. But I, I, I don't really want to, to get into all that. But the, the question is, um, you know, what was their attitude and why did they do it? I mean, it was a lot of demand for it. Lots of people want this pre-55 Holy Week because the changes made in 1955 were, um, were in some ways an anticipation of the Nervous Order and in some ways, they were experiments which, when they did come to do the Noah's Ordo, they thought had not been successful. Um, so they didn't do it. So, for example, there are actually more readings in the Noah's Ordo um, Easter Vigil than there are in the 1955 era traditional Easter Vigil. And that's a bit strange. Well, they, they went too far. So the Noah's Ordo actually reversed, to some extent, that change. So it's difficult to work out much enthusiasm for a form of the Holy Week services which, on the one hand, um, are less traditional, less, you know, more anticipating the, the, the Novus Ordo kind of way of doing things, and on the other hand were partly, well, in fact, the Holy, um, rejected by the Novus Ordo creators for all sorts of reasons. So why, why are we using 
these ones. Well, it's a historical accident that these were in place in 1962. Um, and it's important to bear in mind that the liturgical reform was a very long kind of planned thing. I, I, I don't want it planned in a sort of detailed way, but people have been talking about it and writing about it and thinking about it and coming up with schemes since, you know, throughout the 20th century. Um, and you look at the promulgation of the 1955 books, and it's clearly there's going to be more changes. We've done these things because we're going to do other things, you know. To other. So, for example, they, they, they were planning to extend some of the principles to the rest of the liturgy. And to some extent, that happened. For example, the disappearance of the maniple in the, in the tridium um, on Good Friday. They didn't have a maniple. Well, the maniple's abolished completely later on. Um, so, um, 1960 changes also. Um, the new rubrics of 1960, it says in the preface, um, oh, we're just anticipating a more general reform later on. Uh, which is also what was said in 1964 and 1967 when they brought in more things. These are changes that we can implement now, which um, anticipating the, the, the major changes which are being planned, already written, and, and, and stuff. So um, they're all, you know, the, the question then is, well, do we actually want these, these, these changes? And if they're big, then it's a difficult question. If they're very small, then often they can just be rolled back without really anyone noticing. Um, so some of the small things, I'm not even going to go into detail because it kind of, you, you have endless arguments online about these sorts of things, and it's a complete waste of breath. Um, if people want to do things that were done, you know, that you would, you know, normal person wouldn't even notice, uh, but which are quite nice, you know, before 1962, 1960, 1955, then, well, why not? You know, just get on with it and just don't bore us all to death in the process. <laughs>